Dictators are afraid of books. They carry powerful ideas, can influence people, open their eyes, make them realize that the regime under which they live in is not as ideal as they initially thought. This is why dictators are afraid of writers, especially those who are against the regime. Thus, they resort to censorship, torture, and even killing in order to prevent their ideas from spreading. In some cases, they even resort to book burnings. The most famous book burning in history took place in the year 1933 in Germany and was carried out by staunch Hitler supporters. On the 30th of January 1933, Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany following a series of electoral victories of the Nazi party. On the 10th of May of that same year, that is, a few months later, many students made it to the streets in order to burn more than 25,000 un-German books. This movement, which started in Berlin in the Opera Square, rapidly spread to other cities in the country, amongst which Munich was to be found. These students pillaged books from university and public libraries and created bonfires on the streets with the books. They sought to purify German literature. Thus, more than 300 authors were targeted that day. But what were they trying to purify German literature from? Well, as you can imagine, Jewish authors were targeted. Freud, Einstein, Stefan Zweig or Heinrich Heine were amongst them. But also socialist thinkers and writers such as Karl Marx and Rosa Luxemburg. Their books were also burned on that tragic day. And finally, diverse authors such as Thomas Mann, who was a staunch opposer of the Nazi regime, or Ernest Hemingway, were also targeted. The memorial you can see behind me right now, that spiral of words, has been created in order to remind us of that tragic day. What you can read on it is the names of the books and the names of the authors that were burned on the bonfires. It is supposed to be located exactly on the same place where that bonfire took place here in Munich. The building you see behind me right now is the headquarter of the Bayerische Landesbank, the Bavarian State Bank. But many years ago, this place was a synonym of a lot of pain, suffering and death. The Wittelsbacher Palais, a palace built in the 19th century by the King Maximilian II, was located right behind me. It was destructed during the Second World War, but from the year 1933 onwards, that place became the headquarters of the Gestapo. The Gestapo, or Geheime Staatspolizei, was the secret police of Nazi Germany. It was founded in the year 1933 by Hermann Göring. A year afterwards, they decided to construct 22 cells in the space you see behind me. It was here where, for instance, Hans and Sophie Scholl, two of the most renowned members of the Weiße Rose, a resistance movement, were held captives. They would be assassinated shortly afterwards. As you might remember from my last episode, in the year 1923, Hitler staged a failed coup d'etat, known as the Beerhold Putsch. That day, 16 Nazis and four policemen died. Hitler would always remember this day with pride, especially the 16 Nazis that perished, who would acquire sort of a martyrdom status for him. Now that Hitler was ruling the country with full powers, he decided to honor them in a sumptuous way. In the place you see behind me right now, that place full of grass, full of trees, not very taken care of, he located the honor temples. Well, one of the honor temples, I should say, because the other honor temple was located on this side of the street. On this side, 
also not very taken care of, full of grass and trees. These temples were two majestic structures constructed in the year 1935 that hosted the sarcophagi, the corpse, the coffins of the 16 Nazis that perished on that day of 1923. Blood witnesses, blood witnesses, he used to call them. But what happened to them, you might be wondering? Well, in the year 1947, the US Army blew them up as part of the denazification process. Still, if you have a look on the internet, you will find several images of these very impressive structures. A few meters further away from where the honor temples were located, you can find the impressive building you see behind me right now. Its construction finalized in the year 1937, five years after it began. And although now it hosts the Hochschule für Musik und Theater, the University of Music and Performing Arts, this building has a way darker past. During the Nazi time, this building was Hitler's representative office the Führerbau, the Führer's building. Relevant personalities visited it. For instance, Benito Mussolini in the year 1937. He visited Munich in order to sign a military alliance. Both powers were now part of the Berlin-Rome axis. In fact, if you check it out on the internet, you will find a picture where you can see both dictators greeting from one of these two balconies. Another relevant personality that visited this building was Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of the UK. He came to Munich in the year 1938 to sign the Munich Accord, the agreement that would cede part of Czechoslovakia to Germany. As a reminder of that event, we have this commemorative plaque here. I hope you remember everything I told you about this building if you're a student of the Hochschule für Musik und Theater. One could very well posit that Hitler was a failed artist. When he was very young and lived in Vienna, he was rejected by the Academy of Fine Arts in two consecutive years. After these rejections, Hitler tried to make a living by being a painter, but he barely managed to make ends meet. At some point, he even had to live in a shelter for beggars, for homeless people. Hitler's past as a failed artist would mark his artistic tastes later on. He would harbor a bitter resentment towards the modern art, what he would call the degenerate art. He deemed that those new vanguardist tendencies were partly the reason as to why he had failed. Hitler liked painting landscapes, buildings, depicting reality. But at the beginning of the 20th century, those things were not trendy anymore. Trends such as Cubism, Dadaism, Expressionism were taking over, they were becoming the new norm. Hitler's idyllic landscapes had no place in this new society. So now that he had full powers, Hitler decided to take his vendetta. In order to promote what he considered to be the right art, the ideal art, the official art, Hitler decided to build a museum, which is the museum you see right behind me, the Haus der Deutschen Kunst. On the day of its inauguration, in the year 1937, Hitler decided to make a great propaganda event out of it. He created two exhibitions. One, the Great German Art Exhibition. The other, the Degenerate Art Exhibition. His goal was to contrast both styles, ridiculing the latter. But what would you find in each of the exhibitions if you had been present that day, you might be wondering. Well, on the Great German Art Exhibition, what you would have seen is, for instance, statues of the Greeks and the Romans. Hitler loved them because he thought they embodied the racial idea, the racial purity with those perfect bodies. You would also find landscapes, paintings, nature. That is the kind of art that Hitler liked and that he used to paint when he was young. 
In the Degenerate Art Exhibition, you would have found names such as Picasso, Kokochka, Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, all representatives of styles such as Dadaism, Cubism and Impressionism, all of which were disliked by Hitler. As you can imagine, Hitler's views on art led to the prosecution of many well-known artists. This is why many of them decided to emigrate. Paul Klee left to Switzerland, Kandinsky went to Paris, Kokochka went to England, and Roos decided to leave for the United States. Luckily though, Hitler's views on art did not prevail, and today this museum only harbors pieces of modern art. The 9th of November is by far the most relevant date in German history. Events that took place on that day were, for instance, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, and the November Revolution, which ousted the Kaiser and inaugurated the Weimar Republic. But by far, the most tragical 9th of November in German history was the one that took place in the year 1938 which became known as the Night of Broken Glass. On that day, synagogues were plundered and burned to the ground. More than 100 Jews were killed and more than 30,000 Jews were sent to concentration camps. But why and how did that event take place? On that 9th of November, 1938, Hitler and the most prominent members of the Nazi parties were having dinner here in Munich. They were commemorating the 15th anniversary of the failed coup d'etat of the year 1923, the Beer Hall Putsch. While eating, they were told some tragic news, namely that a German diplomat had been assassinated in Paris by a Polish Jew. This was all the excuse Hitler needed to ramp up his measures against the Jewish community. Under his orders, Goebbels, the propaganda minister, came out to the old city hall, which you can see behind me right now, to give an anti-Semitic speech. In that speech, he instigated, encouraged people to go out to the streets and start being violent against the Jews. On that same night, the boss of the Gestapo sent a message to all police units telling them not to intervene in the events that were about to unfold. What happened afterwards was just a tragedy. Men from the SA, the SS and lay policemen broke into Jewish stores, destroying everything. They also burned synagogues to the ground and threatened, violented, imprisoned and killed many Jews. I will give you some numbers so that you can make yourself an idea of the extent of the tragedy. More than 100 Jews were killed in one night. More than 30,000 were sent to concentration camps and more than half of all the synagogues that existed in Germany and Austria were burned to the ground, destroyed. The name of that night, the Night of Broken Glass, was coined because if you had walked around after that night, around the Jewish stores that had been plundered, you would have found just that, loads of broken glass. The events of that 9th of November were a turning point in German history. It marked the transition from a policy of discrimination against the Jewish population to a policy of systematic prosecution. It now became clear to the Jews that their lives were in danger. This is why more than 200,000 Jews fled the Third Reich between the 9th of November 1938 and the beginning of the Second World War which would take place a few months later. Now I find myself below the old city hall, the place where Goebbels gave the infamous speech that would give rise to the events of that tragic night. In order to commemorate the victims that perished that day, this commemorative plaque has been placed here. Both in German, as you can read in the big plaque, and in English here in this small plague. 
with this small tribute to the people who perished that day, I'd like to finish this video. If you liked it, if you think it added value, please give it a like and share it with at least one person. This would greatly help my channel. Thank you and see you in my next video.